Good morning, Loma Linda University Church. It is so good to worship with you today online. If you're joining with us for the first time, we're in part three of our message series entitled First, Second, Third, and Fourth, where we look at reprioritizing our lives with priorities that will give us life this new year. First off, Pastor Randy talked about the first priority of God in your life. Secondly, Pastor Phil, he talked about prioritizing family. Now today, I want to take you deeper into the third priority on the list of life, the priority of work. Now, I want to start out by proving to you this morning that I am a working man. I was and have been a working man. So I'd like you to take a look at this picture of me at my first job, my beloved job at Wendy's as head grill master. Okay, I wasn't exactly the head grill master, but I still am very proud of this. You know, there's so many different types of, of working people. Maybe you're that baby boomer workaholic that doesn't know how to take a break. No matter how much money you have in your bank account, and you're, you're already a millionaire, <laughs> you always tell your kids, sorry kids, we, we can't afford it. Or maybe you're that young millennial who is constantly on the internet, you're Googling ways to retire at the age of 25, and you're certain that you can get rich working part-time delivering for Uber Eats. <laughs> or maybe you're, you're one of those people who just really wants to do a lot of things and accomplish a lot, but you're just simply trapped in a body that only wants to sleep. Okay, that one I can relate to. And you know what, it's not your fault. It's, it's just that body of yours. Well, no matter who you are, we all know what it means to work in this life. Okay, but seriously, whoever came up with the word work, do you think they could have come up with something a bit more uh, colorful, a fun word or a phrase? Like, like, why not something a bit more inspiring? You know, throw in some medieval language or something. You know, as you head out the door, instead of saying like, honey, I'll uh, see you later. I got to go to work. You can say, honey, as a warrior placed on this planet, I must embark on my daily conquest to destroy my foe known as my to-do list. I will bring back its spoils to share with you, my beautiful queen, before I must risk it, risk it all again in the morrow. I think my wife, she, she probably actually kind of liked that, and probably yours too. Well, I don't know if we could talk like that. Maybe we'd, maybe we'd be a bit more inspired. Well, right from Genesis, humanity begins this kind of weird relationship with work. In Genesis 3, starting in verse 17, God has this consequential conversation with Adam and Eve about work. Right after they had eaten the forbidden fruit, God says this. He, he said to Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife, and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. And just to be clear, this verse is not talking about not listening to your wife. It's much deeper than that. It goes on to say, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. You see right here, humanity had, they'd kind of blown it. We were on this endless vacation, and, and now we had to go out the front door and go to work. And now we spend our lives working to work, working to make ends meet, working to have that comfortable retirement, working to be labeled successful, working because sometimes it even feels good. And not only that, we, you know, we live in a culture and society where, where you are very much valued by your work, your success, your accomplishments, by, by how much you get done in a week. We value the overtimer. We value the overachiever. We value the 50-hour work week. We value work, you know, whether it's in your finances, your, your professional career, your side hustle, or your personal development, your identity and value are often found in your work. I find it interesting that sin brought on this hard work, but it was the hard work of Jesus that defeated sin. You know, and in a world where you have to work to survive, I believe that the story of Jesus redeeming and life-giving work here on this planet is an example for us and can give us principles to work in a way that can bring life to ourselves and to those around us. You know, you can get a, a quick summary glimpse of Christ's work in Scripture. In Philippians 2, 6-11, it says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something, something to be used to, be his own, to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know, I love this because I think this is the perfect starting place. Because just as Jesus' work on this earth brought life, if, if you want to work in a way that can bring life to yourself and to the people around you, you've, you've got to start with this. You've got to work down, not up. When I was 16 years old, I, I got a job at a summer camp in, way up in Canada. My position was a wrangler down at the horse corrals. And, and now, I, I don't know if you can imagine me as a wrangler, but uh, Josh Jamison, yes, at one point in time, worked with horses. And I absolutely loved nothing about it. The first week I realized that I did not want to be a wrangler. I didn't like to be around the horses. I didn't like to ride them. And in fact, when, when the team asked for a volunteer to go clean the stalls, I was the first person to volunteer because it was the place that I would least likely die by horse. I was seriously the, the guy that was trying to get the petition signed to get rid of the horses and to get dirt bikes instead. To tell you the truth, I, I was the biggest hypocrite. I'd get all the kids all psyched up for going for a trail ride. I'd say, you guys are going to have the time of your lives being up high on that horse. And they'd be all excited. And then for the whole trail ride, me, their instructor, would not actually be riding the horse at all. <laughs> I would just be walking it beside it the whole time. And the kids would ask, Josh, why aren't you riding? And I'd be like, well, I'm just going to walk this one. You see, I didn't, I didn't want to work up on that horse. No, I wanted to work down. And you're probably wondering, Josh, what in the world does it mean to work down? What in the world does it mean to work down and not up? Well, you see, Christ worked down, not up. <laughs> From the very start, just like we step out of our front door every day and go to work, Christ stepped out of his heavenly door and came down to earth and went to work. In Philippians 2 verse 6, it says, Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see right here, Jesus stripped off his heavenly robes and put on his human overalls and came down to this earth. And all throughout his time in ministry here on earth, he got down when he worked. He got down on his knees when he wrote in the sand and he saved the woman caught in the act of adultery from being stoned by the religious leaders. He got down low and he healed the lame man by the pool of Bethsaida. He bent down to each one of his disciples as he washed their feet in the upper room because of his, before his crucifixion. And finally, he did his greatest work down in the grave where he defeated death and sin once and for all and gave humanity a, a chance at life. See, Jesus worked down and not up. He wasn't trying to climb up the ladder of success. He didn't put his own interests before the interests of others. You know, it says he became a servant and humbled himself. Let me ask you this this morning. Are you working down or are you working up? Are you working and living your life in a way uh, that has its own interests in mind or the interests of others? Are you simply living to climb the ladder of success, even if it means stepping on your own relationships? Are you working to bring life to only yourself or to others? Well, hey, maybe God is calling you to literally work down today. Maybe he's calling you as a nurse to literally get down on your knees to comfort and hold the hand of that dying COVID patient who doesn't have any family to comfort them in their last minutes. You know, maybe he's calling you as a doctor to, to work down and to comfort that nurse who just, who just can't keep going on anymore. Or maybe God, you know, he's, he's calling you this morning to, to work down as a pastor, to stop focusing on your success and pride, but, but start focusing on serving and people. Maybe you've, you've found yourself in a position of financial stability in your life and God is calling you to work down by, by giving that portion of wealth to a deserving student to pay off their loans. Are you simply working up or, or are you simply working for your own interest, for your own success? Or are you working to make this world a better place 
to change the life of the person next to you? Are you working down? Well, the second principle that can bring life to you and to those around you is to work out of a mindset of abundance and not scarcity. In Philippians 2 verse 9, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see right here, when, when Jesus stepped out of the front door of his kingdom and, and came to work here on this earth as a human being, he came and he worked with a mindset of abundance, not one of scarcity. He came with a vision of abundant grace for all humanity. Not just for some, but for all, where every knee would bow and every tongue would confess the name of Jesus. You know, and, and all throughout his ministry, we see Jesus work in this way. You know, when he fed the 5,000, he, he didn't just feed them one serving, you know, even though that in itself was a huge feat. No, there were 12 baskets of food left over. When he told his disciples to cast out their nets on the other side of the boat, you know, his disciples didn't just reel in a few fish. No, they brought in enough to where the nets almost broke and others had to come out in their boat to help them carry them back in. You know, even the stories that Jesus told were such as the prodigal son coming home, and the father threw a massive party with excess beyond what he deserved. You see, Jesus, he, he worked out of a vision of abundance, not scarcity. He worked out of a vision that went above and beyond what people thought was possible. As a pastor here at Loma Linda University Church, I want to work with that same mindset of abundance. I believe that LLUC has the power to not only impact the city of Loma Linda, but how we have the ability to impact Redlands, Colton, San Bernardino, Grand Terrace, Highlands, LA, and beyond. And maybe God is calling us to even, even a more abundant mindset. Maybe God is calling us to change the world. I want to work with an abundant vision, an abundant vision that comes from God. I believe it when Scripture says in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy that God will open the storehouses of heaven and bless the work of our hands. You know, and, and I truly believe that under the leadership of Pastor Randy, that this church has a vision of working with a mindset of abundance. You know, you can look around and, and just look at the beautiful new ministry center that uh, we will house our new contemporary service anthem and so much more. And it's now finished and waiting to be used for ministry in all kinds of different and creative ways. You know, that is the result of working with a mindset of abundance and not scarcity. Well, this morning, maybe God is calling you to live and work with a mindset of abundance. Maybe it's in your finances. God is, is really calling you to stop living from paycheck to paycheck. But to begin to have a mindset of wealth, instead of saying, I, I don't have enough money to live, ha, rather uh, say, I, I serve a God that has and will provide, and I choose to wisely steward what he has given me. Maybe you lead a department at the medical center. You know, are you leading it with vision, a big vision? Are you leading from a place that inspires those around you to strive for the best, inspires them to, them to achieve what they thought wasn't possible? And as an elder at a church, you know, are, are you willing to minister and work with an abundant mindset of grace? Where instead of rejecting that teen couple who, who got pregnant out of wedlock, you're able to embrace them with an abundance of love and support like never seen before. You know, when you shepherd your flock as a pastor, do you believe that God can expand your church's influence beyond what you thought was possible? So this morning, are you working out of a mindset of abundance? You see, I want to live and I want to work in that place of abundance because my CEO, my boss is the creator of the universe. And I believe that he has the storehouses of heaven at his disposal. Well, the third principle this morning for working in a way that can bring life to you and to those around you is to Work second. Yeah, some of you really need to put this one into action. Because <laughs> according to data released by uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in one month, the U.S. workforce works about 3.9 billion hours in total. You know, we're so valued by how much we work, by the success that we have, by how much money we have in the bank account. And, and let me ask you this, in a society that values work, are you willing to go against the grain? You know, even in the business of, of his gospel work, Jesus knew how to put work second. He knew when he needed to take a break. He knew when he needed to get away from the crowds and rest. 
He knew that in order to bring life to himself and to those around him, he, he had to put work second. He knew how to put the important things before work. You know, Scripture says he would wake up early in the morning and go pray. You see, Jesus first was resting in the presence of his Father. And he knew that for us humans, <laughs> we would have a hard time getting our priorities straight. He knew that work would work its place into first. And that's why he taught about seeking first the kingdom of heaven and that all the other things would work themselves out. Well, maybe this morning you need to embrace this concept of work second. Maybe you need to take a break. Maybe when you wake up in the morning, instead of reaching for the light of the phone, maybe you need to reach for the light of the world. Maybe you need to truly embrace Sabbath rest. Maybe God is calling you to put aside your ambitions for just a moment, to just be with him for just a few minutes. Work second. Well, I want to close on this, um, this last point. And now I know that sermons are only supposed to have three points, but this one, this one's just too good. I couldn't leave it out. This last point is that Jesus did the work so that you wouldn't have to. <laughs> the story that's told of, of, of a teacher who asks her class, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and this little boy, little Johnny says, he says, I want to be a billionaire. I want to go to the most expensive restaurants. I'm going to have a super pretty wife. I'm going to give her a Ferrari uh, that's over a million bucks. I'm, I'm going to uh, give her an apartment in Hawaii, a mansion in Paris, a jet to travel with. She's going to have an infinite visa card, and I'll kiss her three times a day. Well, the teacher, she was kind of shocked and not really knowing how to respond, just continued with the lesson and asked another child. She asked another little girl. She said, Susie, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, Susie looked at her and she responded, I want to be Johnny's wife. You see, Susie knew that someone else was going to do the work. And maybe like Susie this morning, you need to realize that someone else can and has already done the work for you. Maybe you've been working so hard to, to, to be holy, to eat, to, to say and wear the right things, to earn your own salvation. Well, let me tell you some good news this morning. Jesus did the work so that you wouldn't have to anymore. You need to stop trying to do that work because that job is already taken. And guess what? There's only one person qualified to be in that position, and it's not you. You see, Jesus came to this earth with a mission of abundant grace for the whole world. He came to this world through an excess, to save the world through an excess amount of love that it didn't deserve. He came to work down and not up. He came to serve those around him. He came to better this planet. And it's, it's time for you to take a break. In fact, don't just take a break, but, but stop. Stop doing the job that Jesus already did for you. If that's you and, and you're exhausted and you're just simply over it, I, I want to personally give you permission to rest in his grace and love this morning. So today, I ask you, will you work in the way that Christ worked for you? Will you work in a way that brings life to you and to those around you? Will you work down and not up? Will you work within a mindset of abundance, not scarcity? Will you work second, putting God at the top of this life's priority list? You know, I want Jesus to be first in my life. How about you?